concludes topical questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion 2795 in the name of Fiona Hislop on the implications for culture, creative industries and tourism following the EU referendum. And I would ask members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And if the Cabinet Secretary is ready, I will call on Fiona Hislop to speak to and to move the motion. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I move the motion in my name. I'm very pleased to have secured this afternoon's debate to discuss the critical issues within my wider portfolio as a result of the EU referendum. The shock and dismay expressed by our cultural and creative industries and our tourism sector was immediate, heartfelt and emphatic. We have overwhelming support from these sectors for our place in the EU. The Creative Industries Federation, for example, has stated that 96% of respondents to a survey of their membership were in favour of remaining within the EU. In the five months since the referendum, I have been incredibly encouraged by how these sectors have mobilised, harnessing their collective resources to initiate key pieces of work, such as the reports produced by the Creative Industries Federation and the Scottish Tourism Alliance, which have provided invaluable feedback on areas of concern. Now, Brexit has not yet happened, but the referendum result had immediate effects. The devaluation of the pound resulted in performers at the Edinburgh International Festival in August needing to be paid in their own currency rather than in sterling, increasing costs to the AIF. We know that parts of our tourism industry have seen some short-term benefits through the initial devaluation of sterling, but there have also been increases to operating costs, particularly in relation to fuel and food prices. We have also seen an inevitable loss of UK government influence in the EU and some ostracising of the UK from decision-making processes. But our voice must continue to be heard in decision making and our interests represented in, for example, digital single market negotiations as they will affect our creative industries long term development. But while we already have seen the immediate impacts of the vote to leave the EU, the longer term effects are far less certain and far more concerning. The Scottish Government is exploring all options to avoid a hard Brexit and preserve the benefits that we know our sectors gain from our relationship with the EU. The leaked memo outside Downing Street, if in any way true, points again to the UK Government pursuing a hard Brexit. And a hard Brexit must be resisted, not just for Scotland, but across the UK. Now, Presiding Officer, we know that our sectors are resilient, not least because of the exceptional offer that we have in terms of our landscapes, history, heritage, culture and our events and festivals. But we must ensure that there are no limitations placed on our labour supply so that the skills required by our cultural, creative and tourism businesses remain accessible and the future of these industries is not put at risk. Over 21,000 staff from the EU are employed in Scotland's tourism industry. That is almost 17% of those working in the sector. And a hard Brexit with no protection for existing EU employees could have catastrophic consequences for the industry. There are also concerns about future infrastructure investment in the hotel sector and our ability to attract and support new direct air routes, as well as protecting the UK more generally as an aviation hub. And we know that Scotland already attracts many European visitors and they are contributing substantially to our economy. In 2015, visitors from Germany made 323,000 trips to Scotland, spending £175 million. There were further 196,000 trips from France, with our French visitors spending £118 million. And we must continue not only to sustain, but to grow that contribution to support this vital industry and to strengthen its place as one of our key growth sectors. And that will rely on Scotland maintaining our warm, welcoming outlook. And we must ensure that our European neighbours are in no doubt that Scotland wants to maintain our close relationship <coughs> with them. And we can't allow the UK government's efforts to change these relationships, tarnish and diminish Scotland's positive international <laughs> reputation. And Scotland enjoys a wide, worldwide reputation for the warmth of its welcome. And that reputation has been crystallised in recent months through the success of Visit Scotland's Spirit of Scotland campaign launched by the First Minister in February. And that launch fundamentally changed the way Scotland is marketed around the world. One global brand with one global welcome. And that welcome is now particularly important for our visitors from the EU. 
And although other parts of the United Kingdom may be seeing their rep reputation suffer and are perhaps being viewed as a less than welcoming place to visit, Scotland's doors remain open and that welcome is there. And our most recent Ar Arnott Han uh, Anholt Nation Brand Index score was 61.8. And that score ranked us in 17th place and showed that our reputation abroad is still strong, at least similar to and sometimes ahead of other competitors. And we must remember that seven of our top 10 visitor markets are in Europe, so we need to make sure they know that Scotland has that welcome. And our existing relationships with our European neighbours encapsulates who we want to be as citizens of an outward-facing nation, and no matter what happens, these relationships will not suddenly cease to be. Scotland is and has been throughout our history an open and outward-looking country, and our contemporary culture um, and place as a world-class destination reflects that. The Edinburgh International's festival slogan this summer, Welcome World, was a fitting and timely focus for a festival that has become the largest of its kind in the world and which is the model of international cooperation through culture and the arts. Founded in 1947, it was rooted in the idea that culture must be a positive force for reconstructing a shattered post-war Europe. But as the Edinburgh Festivals now develop plans to celebrate their 70th anniversary in 2017, they have deep concerns about the impact of leaving the EU and what that could have on their globally respected work um, that brings the world to Scotland each year. And I note the Labour Amendment stresses the importance of this anniversary. Fergus Lunahan, director of the Edinburgh International Festival, told the Herald on the 18th of November about the dramatic negative impact that the referendum result was already having on their budgets through the fall in Stirling. Donald Shaw, artistic director of the Celtic Connection, suggested that this same issue has already caused them to cut back on the number of American artists coming to the 2017 festival. These are significant concerns to the position of our festivals and their international outlook. The, Ed, the European Capital of Culture programme demonstrates the tangible benefits of cultural exchange through the EU. Places which hold the title can expect to achieve cultural, regenerative and economic benefits. I have today, President Officer, written to the UK Secretary of State for Culture, Karen Bradley, urgently seeking clarity on her intentions for the UK participation in the Capital of Culture programme. Dundee are aiming to hold the title in 2023 and have already invested a significant amount of time, energy and funding into their bid. They must not now have the rug pulled from under them. And the EU enriches Scotland's culture by bringing the culture of other countries to us, both for business and pleasure, and supporting Scottish artists, tourism and hospitality organisations to develop their international networks, creating perspective and influence. And that interpersonal connection is very valuable in these sectors. We already know that artists and performers from outside of the EU can already experience difficulties in bringing their work to the UK in terms of administrative burdens and costs associated with obtaining visas. European artists currently do not face the same difficulties and we will oppose any changes that could ne negatively impact on them and the significant value that they add to Scotland's culture and the value they add to our experience of the wider world. And access to the labour market of 500 million people is vital to our sectors in both economic and cultural terms. Our national performing companies have significant numbers of artists from other EU countries helping to deliver the excellent performances they produce. Almost 40% of the performers at Scottish Ballet come from the EU. Our tourism sector too depends on the numbers of EU nationals that work within it. To reiterate, 21,000 EU nationals work in Scotland's tourism industry, 17% of the total workforce. And already the sector are experiencing difficulties in recruiting chefs and staff with certain language schools. Reducing the ease by which these skills can be accessed from around the EU will only exacerbate these difficulties and seriously harm the sector. So we need our sectors to have unrestricted access to as wide a pool of talent as possible in the EU, filling skills gap and making sure companies have the right people to deliver their services. And the EU membership has also provided a framework for our sectors to grow. I mentioned proposals for the EU digital single market. That could add 415 million euros to the EU's GDP. So access to an EU-wide single market for digital goods and services would have huge benefits for Scotland's creative industries and their development. But we must also ensure that the proposals meet the needs of our stakeholders. I have spoken twice at the EU Culture and Audiovisual Council on digital single market issues and will continue to use all the channels available to me to represent the interests of our stakeholders as these proposals develop. However, it is unclear how strongly the UK government can now influence the shape of these proposals and realise their potential for our sectors uh, and indeed whether we can participate even in them. 
And this is vital in both an economic and cultural sense. As the EU currently constitutes a market for our cultural and creative offer, and EU regulation also supports artistic creation. Rebecca O'Brien of 16 Films, the producer of Ken Loach's Pandora winning I, Daniel Blake, has stated that all of the company's films in recent decades have been European co-productions. Leaving the EU does not necessarily stop this type of artistic and creative collaboration, but it is likely to make it significantly more difficult and impact potentially on funding. And EU funding for culture and tourism provides important financial resources to our sector. Equally as important are the development opportunities that the EU's funding programmes provide for our cultural and creative sectors. For the 2015-18 European Regional Development Programme, Visit Scotland will draw down £11.7 million, which will go to help our tourism SMEs internationalise their business. And that is £11.7 million of support that could be lost if this funding ends. And this is only a small part of our European funding. And I think it could be felt hardest amongst our young people. 34% of the tourism industry workforce in the UK is under the age of 25, three times the proportion working across the economy as a whole. And loss of current considerable EU funding would be detrimental to youth employment. Since the launch of the Creative Europe programme in 2014, 33 grants have been made to projects involving Scottish organisations. And these grants have a total value of 11.5 million euros. But it's the networking and the learning opportunities that these projects provide, which are of equal importance as the monetary value and that interconnectedness of the free movement of people, engendering the creativity of ideas and connections, particularly in our creative industries and our cultural sector, which are really important and, and have a great value in and of themselves. EU funding is important to our sectors, but those relationships and the knowledge that European collaboration can help us to develop is also a, a critical part of our relationship. The importance of protecting Scotland's relationship with the European Union is clear for these sectors. For culture, for creative industries and tourism, it's particularly relevant in terms of workforce and freedom of movement, where we rely on our strong networks to maintain our position as a modern, progressive nation with a global outlook. Our ties, presiding officer, with Europe are historic, and we need to protect them if we're conti to continue to reap the benefits, both from an economic perspective, but also to protect our commitment to cultural and intellectual collaboration. Scotland's culture is one of the many that make up Europe's rich, diverse, and shared heritage. Scotland is not separate from Europe. European culture is our culture, and we're determined to protect all that our close relationship with our neighbours adds to the lives of each and every one of us in this country. Presiding officer, I move the motion in my name. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Jackson Carlow to speak to and move Amendment 2795.1. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Mrs. Carlow has given me strict instructions that I am to keep my blood pressure in check during this debate, but here we are again. Mercifully, at least in this, the twelfth debate in Brexit, this magnificent confection of SNP smears, scaremongering and grievance is set to detain us for only a couple of hours. In moving the amendment in my name, I also welcome the contributions of John Lamont and Rachel Hamilton, which will focus on tourism, Jamie Green on the digital economy, and Douglas Ross, who will draw the threads together at the conclusion. Let's begin then with Scotland, a European nation, in which Nicola Sturgeon, like Pauline in the silent movie era, tells us she is in peril. Who is this pamphlet aimed at? What thesaurus of Scottish cultural history was thumbed through, and by whom, to equate the significance of our vote in June with Dolly the Sheep? What did this nonsense cost the taxpayer? Let me start then with a quote from chapter five, the conclusion, in which with all the bounty of the richest fountain of largesse, Mr. Russell and Ms. Hislop state, whilst we accept that the formal EU negotiating role belongs constitutionally to the UK, well, gee, thanks, it's also clear that Scotland's political history and current constitutional framework make it imperative that our distinctive voice and view are heard loud and clear in London and throughout Europe. There is a difference between representing our distinctive voice and the vacuous parade of European capitals that Mr. Russell and Scotland's own Evita, the First Minister, have indulged themselves in, with seemingly no tangible benefit of any material kind since June. As the actor Tom Hanks reportedly admonished serial whingers after the US presidential election, it's time to put on your big boy pants 
and get on with making a success of the country as it is and not as you would have it. Well, Mr. Russell and Ms. Huslop, it's time for you to both put on your big boy pants and stop the ceaseless whinging across Europe and wider world, culminating in this Armageddon motion for the culture and tourism se sector on the decision none of we three voted for in June, but which gained 17 million votes and a majority across the UK. Brexit means, in a moment, Brexit means that Alec Neil was on the winning side of that vote, we three were on the wrong side, and Scotland and the UK will be leaving the European Union. Mr Russell. Michael Russell. Assuming that the opinions of uh, the, your cons Mr uh, Carlos' constituents have not changed, when will you have the courage of your constituents' convictions and start to speak up for what they believe about this? Along with me, for the, for, for the United Kingdom to remain in the European Union. What they certainly didn't do was to vote for you to hijack their uh, representation of the European referendum as an excuse for independence to be trailed out all over again. What benefit is it to culture, tourism or our creative industries to be called the Scottish shambles by the government of China? To campaign naively like some political ingenue on US polling day against the president-elect of the United States, a country with massive influence in our business and creative arts and artists. To be slapped down by the government of Spain after waffling on about discussions. To be snubbed by Chancellor Merkel. To be told by Denmark that they will not intervene in the UK discussions. To be dismissed by the Czech Republic and be told that it is premature to address the question of an independent Scotland and its relation to the EU, to be slapped down by the President of France who made clear negotiations will be conducted with the United Kingdom, not with a part of the United Kingdom, and finally to be told by Norway that despite the former First Minister blunderbussing around the globe, Scottish membership of EFTA is not possible and urge the FM to engage in a constructive dialogue with the UK Government on that matter. This overreaching, fueled by the messianic subservience of our party, is leading Scotland up a blind alley. At this rate, it may become necessary for the First Minister and Mr Russell to voluntarily surrender their passports before they do any further damage. Their six-month mission has failed to deliver. Their approach is distancing Scotland from the real discussion and debate, undermining Scotland's voice in the negotiation that is soon to come. And contrast the tweets, statements and behaviour of Mr Russell and the First Minister with Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, no supporter of the UK government, who last week tweeted about the positive discussions he was having with the UK <coughs> government to make sure that the world knows London, which also voted to remain, is open for business, and that he is working to ensure the best deal for London and the UK. Enough then of sashaying across the tarmac at number 10, sweeping past the Scottish news teams to grandstand for the benefit of the UK media. Scotland needs its Eva Perron to get on with the day job and to make sure that the subtle variables that can be negotiated in this process are achieved and not squandered. Make no mistake. Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, the DCMS estimates that 15% of all multi-channel broadcasting jobs in the UK rely on the audiovisual uh, directive. If the UK no longer have full membership of the EU single market, it's highly likely that such regulations would continue to apply and would pose a significant threat to broadcasters and jobs in Scotland. Can we get to the motion in hand, yeah. Mr Carlo? Answer yeah, that question. List of potential scaremongering, none of which is actually validated in substance at all. I remember when ITV stopped showing Miss Marple and Poirot in Scotland, the voter reigns supreme. I very much doubt that the rest of Europe is suddenly going to switch off the opportunity for Scottish programmes, Scottish broadcast, and Scottish participation any more, any more than Britain is going to stop screening Scandinavian or other European television programmes. It's a complete nonsense from this government. Scotland's creative artists have thrived without the EU. As Lewis MacDonald points out in his amendment, it was a Jewish immigrant who founded the Edinburgh Festival, the 70th anniversary of which we are set to celebrate. All of the talent that Fiona Hislop referred to in her earlier motion thrived before we were in the European Union. Did Jack Buchanan need to be in the European Union to become a major global international star? Absolutely not. Our acting talent, musical talent, directors and artists are the toast of the creative arts the world over. Are there challenges ahead? Of course. We are set to unpick a framework evolved over 40 years, but we're not doomed to fail, as these two lamentably insist we are. Will EU nations no longer wish to see our productions? Of course they will. 
The creative industries are worth some 84.1 billion annually to the UK, some 3.7 billion to Scotland, with some 71,800 employed in the sector. Perhaps we'll even be able to reverse the savage 11% cuts to Scottish culture imposed by this government in the last year. As I observed, in the recent debate on the BBC Charter, the Scottish Government needs to do far more than whinge about Brexit. We need studio capacity. The Pentland studio proposals in which the reporter was expected to rule back in June remains moribund. Scottish enterprise lag behind its Northern Irish counterparts in appreciating its role in investing and securing new business for Scotland. Brexit is a challenge, not a brick wall. And working with the UK Government, we can secure a flourishing funding for the arts and tourism working together. Working together. I commend my amendment to the Chamber. I thank Jackson Carlo. I now call on Lewis Macdonald to speak to and move Amendment 2795.2. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Much of the focus of debate since the 23rd of June has been on the economic impact of leaving the European Union and how to maintain the benefits we have derived from being within the EU. Unfettered access to the single market, membership of the customs union have indeed been critical to jobs, business and growth in Scotland and across the United Kingdom for over 40 years. But our place in Europe is not just about trade and investment. It is also about culture, our interaction with the rest of the continent, and our shared values and aspirations for the future. The government's motion today talks about Scotland's culture, creative industries, and tourism sectors. Much of its focus is on economic aspects of those, such as EU funding and collaboration mechanisms, access to key EU markets, and proposals for the digital single market. We agree that all of those industrial sectoral issues are important, and so are Creative Europe grants to projects involving Scottish partners, access to skills and talent, and research and knowledge exchange. But the cultural implications of Brexit go wider and deeper than simply the economic impacts and the institutional relationships between Scotland and the European Union. The choice between engagement and isolation is an economic and a political choice, but it is also a cultural one. That is why, presiding officer, I move the amendment in my name, and it is also why we on this side reject the Conservative amendment today. Indeed, with every passing week, and we've just heard uh, a very good example of it, uh, the Tories' embrace of Brexit appears to become closer and warmer. To talk of the benefits that Brexit may bring to Scotland's culture, creative industries and tourism, at the same time as denouncing the potentially severe negative impact of jeopardising Scotland's unfettered access to the UK single market through more referendums makes no more rational sense than it does to reject Brexit and embrace independence. It is simply fantasy to claim that such benefits may come from the UK government concluding free trade agreements with the EU and other countries around the globe. What we are actually contemplating is the UK withdrawing from agreements with 30 of our friends and neighbours which go far beyond free trade agreements and give access to a single market of 500 million people. Saying you favour free trade while embracing the prospect of tariffs and visas does not the, uh, disguise the reality of what Britain walking away from Europe could actually mean. Culture Counts, the campaign to highlight the value of culture in Scotland with 46 national umbrella and membership bodies across the arts, heritage, screen and creative industries, gave evidence on the implications of Brexit to the Culture, Tour Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee. Their description of the nature of culture is one I think everyone uh, would endorse. Our cultural life is an expression of who we are, they say, who we want to be and how others see us. This is as much true of our collective national identity at home and abroad as it is of the many and diverse artistic expressions we exercise as individuals. Donald Dewar spoke in similar terms at the opening of the Scottish Parliament in 1999. This is about more than our politics and our laws. This is about who we are, how we carry ourselves. Culture in that sense is more than an aggregation of economic benefits. It is cultural life that makes us human, and it is Scotland's open and welcoming culture which we must seek to protect in the difficult and dangerous times that lie ahead. Our amendment therefore highlights the inclusive and outward looking character of that culture because those characteristics are more important today than they have been in many years. The Cabinet Secretary made mention of it, the Edinburgh International Festival will celebrate its 70th anniversary next year, more than two generations of welcoming the world. 
In 1947, Europe was only beginning to recover from the devastating impact of the Second World War. That this country should host a festival of arts and culture as a beacon of hope for Europe was an idea which began with the Jewish entrepreneur uh, Rudolf Bing, who fled from Austria to Britain in the 1930s. It was endorsed by Herbert Morrison, leader of the House of Commons in the post-war Labour government. And Edinburgh overtook Oxford as the host city of choice on the initiative of, Hen of Henry Harvey Wood, who worked in Edinburgh for the British Council. The Edinburgh Festival is in Scotland and of Scotland, but it is not just for Scotland or by Scotland. Its artists, its audiences and its purpose are and always have been for and by the rest of Britain and the rest of the world. And it grew up as a symbol of hope out of the <laughs> darkest times in the modern history of Europe. We in our time cannot fail to see the risk of dark times ahead. We know that there are those who want Britain to turn its back on Europe, just as there are those who want America to turn its back on the world. The need to look outwards, not inwards, has never been greater, and it is as urgent a need here in Scotland as it is anywhere else. So Labour's vision is of a Scotland in the 2020s which has not turned its back either on the rest of Britain or on the rest of Europe, and it is that vision uh, which we propose and will be voting for today. Thank you, Mr MacDonald. And we now move to the open debate. Um, just to remind members, we've actually got plenty of time in hand this afternoon, so feel free to make and take interventions. Uh, I call on Ash Denham to be followed by John Lamont. Ash Denham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Our creative industries are one of Scotland's success stories. Think of a book adapted for a series for Amazon with sweeping Scottish scenery featuring historic castles, and you might well think of Outlander. Think of a top video game, and you may well think of Grand Theft Auto. Think of an arts festival, and you will almost certainly think Edinburgh. But the success of the few I've mentioned here is that they're just as famous outside of Scotland as they are within it. And that's because Scotland's creative industries have an impact. They showcase Scotland. They showcase our homegrown talent and they bring people here in their millions. The sector contributes much to the country in many different ways, but the contribution to the economy is also significant. Data published by the Scottish Development International in June this year showed that Scotland's creative industries contribute £3.7 billion in GVA to the Scottish economy each year. And that's employing 80,000 people and has a total turnover of £5.2 billion. Now, I'm an Edinburgh MSP, and Edinburgh is home to both the International Festival, the Fringe, and a variety of other programmes which make Edinburgh the largest arts festival in the world. There are now 12 major festivals in Edinburgh, the Festival City. The theme of the 2016 Edinburgh Festival was Welcome World, and this was to demonstrate the international outlook of Scotland's festivals. The International Festival in August is a state-of-the-art, world-class cultural event which projects Edinburgh onto a world stage. The festivals combined attract 4.5 million people, generating £280 million for Edinburgh and £313 million for Scotland per year. A survey reported in the Herald recently reported um, that 94% of tourists say that festivals are part of what makes Edinburgh a special place to visit. Festivals are important and integral to the city, but they could be under threat. A change to immigration rules or to funding streams due to Brexit could pose a serious risk to the festivals. Fergus Linnean, the director of EIF, said that the political culture of battening down the hatches was the opposite of the movement that inspired the creation of the festival in 1947 as an example of international cultural exchange to unite people and that we should seek to maintain that. Festivals Edinburgh stated that it was detecting increased caution in international partners in committing to medium to long-term collaborations because of the uncertainty due to Brexit. According to the Brexit report, recently published by the Creative Industries Federation, access to international talent is a pivotal issue for the city. With thousands of international performers programmed every year, changes to UK visa requirements for non-EU performers have already made booking these acts 
far more difficult. Festival organisers are concerned about the impact of tougher visa conditions if they are also extended to European performers as well. European visitors constitute the largest international market, so any changes to the ease of entry by requiring additional visas could damage visitor numbers. It doesn't make sense to me to make it more difficult for visitors to visit us. The Edinburgh International Festivals are among those who have reported an immediate impact on their business planning from the fluctuations in sterling. Given lead times, the International Festival traditionally negotiates contracts with acts in pound sterling in order to protect against fluctuation in international markets. Since the referendum, artists are now insisting on payment in their own currency. This leaves both budgets and profits for these festivals more vulnerable to the changing performance of currencies. Another Scottish success story is video games. With the right conditions, this could be a growth market for Scotland, attracting large amounts of investment money. Scotland is now developing a reputation as a place where creative companies can be built and where they can grow and flourish. But in order to grow companies, we must be able to attract the best talent from around the world. Chris Vanderkull of 4J Studios, which among other things develops Minecraft, which is a particular favourite of my son's, believes that the UK government needs to adopt a more enlightened immigration policy, as skills shortages in the tech sector are constraining growth. He says that foreign students who come to study video games development here were, and I quote, fairly heavily lent on to get out of the country after graduating, unquote, which he said was disastrous. He goes on to say, quote, in our immigration policy, we're very well structured to invite people in who've already proven themselves, but they're already settled. And what we need to do is attract talent that is early career. And that doesn't quite fit the home office boxes that are there at the moment, but that is exactly what we need in our companies, unquote. Creative industries are, by their very nature, collaborative, engaging across borders, bringing ideas and people together. A hard Brexit challenges these principles, principles that underpin the success of these sectors. And that is why a hard Brexit is not in Scotland's best interests and must be challenged. Thank you. John Lamont to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, this is now the 12th debate we've had on the EU <coughs> referendum results. The 12th opportunity for the SNP to stand up and talk about how great the EU is and how everyone in Scotland wants to remain a member. And what, I ask, has been achieved so far? Well, little in the way of clarity on the Scottish Government's position, but much in the way of grievance. We've spent less than half this time debating education, a topic which is supposedly the SNP's number one priority. Nevertheless, I'm happy to speak today on the implications of the UK's decision to leave the EU for culture and tourism, and will focus my remarks on tourism as one of the most important sectors for the borders economy. Presenting officer, the Borders is and will remain a fantastic tourist destination, one which attracts visitors from, part, from all parts of the world. Fiercely proud towns, each with something to offer, and a lot of hard work being carried out by organisations such as the Scottish Borders Tourism Partnership. Let us not overemphasise the impact Brexit will have on tourism. The UK is not part of the Eurozone, the Schengen area, or other features of the EU that impact most on that sector. So withdrawal from the EU will not result in major change. Tourism was not a major consideration in the run-up to the referendum, and there has not been an influx of warnings from tourist leaders since June about the consequences of Brexit. The SNP chaired Scottish Affairs. I just want to make some progress, if I may. The SNP chaired Scottish Affairs Committee opened an inquiry into Scotland's place in Europe shortly after the vote, and not a single, not a single Scottish tourism organisation has responded. This is not the major issue which the Scottish Government is trying to claim that it is for our tourism sector. The Government's motion speaks about the need to maintain freedom of movement and the First Minister has said she wants a deal to maintain membership of the single market. Now we've repeatedly heard from the SNP that one of the benefits of Scottish independence would be our ability to operate a totally different immigration system. However, in the same breath, 
They claim that they, wouldn't, that they won't have a hard border with the rest of the United Kingdom. This is, of course, a complete nonsense. Presiding officer, the First Minister is in Ireland at the moment. There she will see that the Irish quietly align its immigration system with that of the United Kingdom in order to make the common travel area work. The Scottish Government will also be well aware of the fact that Northern Ireland is treated as a special case because of its recent troubled history. So a soft border with the rest of the United Kingdom would only be possible if, like Ireland, Scotland was not part of the Schengen area and if, like Ireland, we align our immigration policy with that of the rest of the United Kingdom. Perhaps the SNP members, or indeed the Minister, could clarify why it would be in the interest of the tourism sector to put up a hard border with the rest of the UK, our nearest neighbour and largest market. Silence. Yeah. Presiding officer. Yeah. I'll be the Minister. Secretary. Member agree with William McLeod, the Executive Director of the Brit British Hospitality Association, that predicted industry growth will be threatened as the demand for staff cannot be met from the domestic job market. Any curbs on access to the European workforce will constrain the industry, impacting on the way we all now live. That is about freedom of movement as part of the single market. Does the member understand that the leaders of our tourism industry are seriously concerned about access to skilled staff unless we have access to the single market, including freedom of movement? And is he against a hard Brexit, yes or no? John Lamont. Well, the, the Minister has, has failed to answer the point that I, I, I made about the impact of a hard border with, with, with the rest of the, Uni the United Kingdom. You cannot have a separate immigration policy in Scotland compared to the rest of the, Uni the United Kingdom without having a hard border. That's a point the Minister has singularly failed to answer. Presiding officer, leaving the EU presents us with a major opportunity to boost tourism. These are not my words, but those of Alex Neil, Deputy Presenting Officer. Since the EU referent referendum result, 57% of businesses feel confident for the next 12 months compared to only 21% who are concerned, according to the Scottish Tourism Alliance. Alliance. Businesses responding to this survey, I just want to finish this, this point I made. Businesses responding to this particular survey realise there are real opportunities to remove red tape, which is a common complaint about many aspects of the EU, improve efficiency and raise Scotland's profile internationally. The fall in the pound has produced a short-term boost, but Brexit can also provide the opportunity for Scotland to explore new and emerging markets outside the EU. I give way to Mr Macdonald. Lewis Macdonald. I'm very grateful to Mr Lamont, and I'm simply curious to know whether he agrees with Alex Neil. John Lamont. I, I, I agree that we need to accept the democratic wishes of the United Kingdom electorate and now need, despite the fact I voted to, to remain part of the EU, respect that result and move to the best deal for my constituents in the borders, the best deal for Scotland and the best deal for the, 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 Uni the United Kingdom. Now the SNP members are shouting up saying, well what is that? Well I'm no clear of what the SNP's position is on that either. Indeed, presiding officer, what was highest on the list of concerns for businesses who responded to this survey, the survey by the Scottish Tourism Alliance? What was highest on the list of those businesses concerned? A survey about Brexit. Now, one of the most common concerns expressed by businesses in the tourism sector was the threat of a second independence referendum, presiding officer. The SNP say they want what's best for Scotland. They say that constitutional uncertainty and leaving markets is bad for business. What the tourism sector wants, Deputy Presiding Officer, is for the threat of a second independence referendum to be taken off the table. Tourism in the Scottish borders has a very bright future with the right support and the right marketing. There are a whole host of opportunities to promote the borders as a great destination for fishing on the Tweed, exploring the Berwickshire coastline, visiting our abbeys or attending one of our many common ridings and festivals, a point which I'm sure the Deputy Presiding Officer would wholeheartedly agree with. One very positive idea the, the Borderlands Initiative seeks to promote the south of Scotland and north of England as a tourist destination. A constituent of mine, Brian Moffat, is a champion of this idea and has written, written extensively about the shared history and potential of the Borderlands. I last raised this idea with the Cabinet Secretary at the beginning of October and I wonder whether she has even managed to give it some further thought and some further um, consideration. 
Deputy Signing Officer, it certainly is in Scotland's interest to maintain a strong relationship with its European and other international partners. The Scottish Government needs to work with the United Kingdom Government to make sure this happens and ensure that tourism in the borders and elsewhere in Scotland is given a bright future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Lamont. <coughs> I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Claire Baker. Mr McMillan, please. Representing officer, just at the, the outset, just I will give uh, John Lambert an opportunity because he spoke about clarity a few moments ago, uh, regarding from the Scottish government. I will give uh, Mr. Lambert an opportunity to provide some clarity on the, his party's position uh, on the, the deal uh, that uh, the UK uh, will actually get out of Europe, if he wants to take that opportunity. Well, what, what is it? What is it that uh, the Conservative Party? and the UK government actually want out of any deal uh, for the UK leaving the European Union. I'll give you the opportunity. Mr Lamont. Oh, thank you, Deputy President. I was happy to continue um, my, 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 my speech. I mean, it's very, very clear that what the UK government wants to achieve is the best deal for my constituents in the borders, the best deal for Scotland and the best deal for, for the United Kingdom, recognising the 70 million votes to leave the European Union. Now, what the SNP need to do, and I'll suggest this to the member, is get the opportunity, get the, the prospect of, a, of having a second independence vote removed from the table to allow tourism and other sectors of the Scottish economy to move forward without that threat hanging over it. Mr. McMillan. Well, uh, once again, uh, a lack of utter clarity uh, uh, from the Conservatives. Uh, and I mean, it was a genuine opportunity uh, I provided the, the member to actually to, to say something on the record. But unfortunately, once again, the Conservatives are lacking in any way, shape or form in terms of clarity and also detail in terms of you, going forward with uh, the European uh, question. Now, presenting officer, there's a couple of points that I do want to touch upon um, to provide some information uh, in terms of uh, some personal experiences. This certainly happened to me uh, some years ago. Uh, and two of Scotland's cultural worldwide brands, or so I thought, uh, are the kilt and the bagpipes. And as every member knows, uh, I take my, my responsibility as a parliamentary piper seriously and I enjoy playing our national instrument. But, but we all have to start somewhere. Uh, and my first attempt at busking internationally was in West Berlin in 1988, outside of the, the Kaiser Wilhelm Church. Uh, I took part in a German exchange trip through school, uh, but being a 16-year-old boy, it was a bit uh, conscious about wearing a kilt uh, too often. So prior to playing, uh, I got changed into the kilt uh, in a bar, uh, in a nearby bar. And uh, when I was leaving to go and actually play, uh, the barman shouted, ah, Englander. Then in 2001, uh, I was the best man and a piper uh, to a, a friend's wedding in a, a small village in France. Uh, and the local mayor, he was uh, delighted to have such an international gathering because my friend Tom, he's Polish French. Uh, and members of his family had uh, travelled from Poland and also from Germany to be there. And then there was me, uh, standing there, pipes, kilt, the whole lot. And according to the mayor, once again, it was referred to as Anglais. Now, the fact I was born in England, uh, actually, it, uh, they were factually correct. Uh, but, uh, but they weren't to know that. But the thing that got me was how, how and when uh, did the kilt and the bagpipes actually become a symbol for England? Now, also, those two events taught me uh, a few lessons and they also can awaken me to a few points. So one of which was that uh, no matter how far travelled Scots are, uh, we still have an educational and a cultural job to undertake when highlighting our country. And the 2014 referendum uh, will have helped with that. Uh, but and certainly, uh, possibly, my, my two anecdotes may well be redundant now. But when we stop telling people about our culture, about our history, and also about our tourism offering, then we actually lose out economically. There was a debate that took place in this chamber a number of years ago. Uh, it was uh, when Jamie McGregor uh, was taking forward the, his member's bill. Uh, and the, the example that was given was regarding golf. Uh, and the number of people internationally who don't recognise or realise that golf is actually a Scottish sport. And that came down to the fact that we stopped telling people that golf is a Scottish sport. But I accept that tartan and pipes it might not be to everyone's taste. I don't know why, but... Uh, but, but they are just two small cogs in our cultural and tourism wheel. And that also helps attract people to our country. It also helps promote our country globally. Now, this is why leaving the single market and the EU provides a huge challenge to Scotland and also to the UK. And I've piped at a few festivals and events across Europe. And leaving the EU in the single market will certainly increase the red tape for performers, both leaving and coming here. Now, what type of effect will that have uh, on some of the many festivals that take place in Scotland on an annual basis. And also, every year Glasgow hosts the World Pipe Band Championships. Bringing a pipe band isn't cheap, particularly for those who travel from elsewhere in the world to actually come here. But for some bands, the added burden of a visa 
and the costs to that might actually stop them from travelling. If it stops them from travelling, it stops them from competing, performing and ultimately visiting our country. And as Janet Archer, the Chief Executive of Creative Scotland, has said, arts and culture transcend borders and bring people together from across the globe. Well, I couldn't agree more. Losing EU funding, restricting freedom of movement of artists, performers and companies, rising costs and an inward focus uh, are major concerns of the cultural sector. Now, now one-fifth of the staff of the National Galleries of Scotland and Scottish Ballet come from Europe. Now, fears have been raised over the loss of international talent from Scotland as a result of leaving the EU and also the single market. Now, today's debate is about culture and tourism. We've had, we've had uh, a number of other debates about other sectors also, and I'm sure that certainly some of the same arguments and reasons uh, both for and against could be raised about all other sectors, including sport and football. Maybe we could go through the SPFL teams and pick out all those players from EU nations. Over the years, many have made a huge positive impact to our game. But something also two weeks ago, I attended in my capacity as the chair of the cross party group on recreational boating and marine tourism, which meets tonight at 6 p.m. in committee room five. The cruise summit hosted by the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Connectivity, Fergus Ewing, MSP. Now, we have made progress in bringing the marine tourism sector together. Uh, and the last year, we saw the publication of Scotland's first ever marine tourism strategy. The strategy emanated out of the work of the cross-party group. In the past two years, Greenock Ocean Terminal has received over 200,000 visitors from cruise tourism. These arrivals generate wealth and business opportunities for the area. And it's also, this, when you consider the staff on the ships, that doubles that figure. Inverclyde has a huge amount to offer uh, to exploit an even greater share of the growing tourism market. Its location lends itself to even greater marine tourism opportunities. Um, you consider that Inverclyde is, is a partner to the, the city deal, uh, and one of the plans is to expand the cruise liner uh, area. Now, cruise tourism uh, is the fastest growing segment of the travel industry. Uh, there has been a 17% growth in economic impact of the European cruise industry in the last five years. The shipbuilding order book is 73 ships on order worth billions of pounds, and 17 of these new ships will have over 5,000 berths. Planning officer, what these figures highlight is a sector that is moving forward and will continue to move forward and help Scotland's economy and also my own area and my own constituency. But just one final point, presiding officer, and that's regarding uh, John Lamott's comments on tourism. Now, last week at the European Committee, we took evidence from Tim Reardon of the UK Chamber of Shipping. And he said on the record, the right of free movement underpins our business, whether it involves tourist, uh, tourist travel uh, by ferry or cruise ships coming in from Western Europe. Because of where Scotland is geographically, it is part of our Northwest European itinerary. So it is predominantly Europeans who are on board the vessels that come into ports in Scotland. Their ability to do so without needing a visa in advance is critical to the success of that business. Presenting officer, Brexit and leaving the single market poses a fresh challenge economically across Scotland and the UK, and it could adversely affect my own constituency. And that's why I will be backing the, the motion in the name of the Cabinet Secretary today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McMillan. You can see we've got time in hand, so I'm being generous uh, with uh, members' speeches. Claire Baker to be followed by Marie Todd. Ms Baker, please. Uh, thank you. I am pleased to contribute to this afternoon's debate. The process of leaving the EU is complex and we are still in the early stages. Previous debates have stressed the great uncertainty surrounding our future in many significant areas and also stressed a desire for us to retain as much as possible of the benefits of membership. The arts, creative industries and tourism are no different. In modern economies, there are huge opportunities for our creative industries. In recognition of this, the EU established the Creative Europe Fund. Uh, creative Europe will support the cultural, creative and audiovisual sectors. And the EU has pledged to invest between the years 2014 to 2020 nearly one and a half billion euros into the creative industries. And during the first two years, it supported 230 UK cultural organisations and audiovisual companies, as well as the cinema distribution of 84 UK films in other European countries, with grants of up to 40 million euros. It is the early days of this fund, but it has already supported projects in Scotland and throughout the UK. As the financial situation in the UK remains challenging, arts, and arts funding and culture are under significant pressure. 
And while I, I recognise the Scottish Government has sought to protect cultural spend, this has largely focused around the national offerings. And meanwhile, the pressure that we see on local authorities, which support much cultural activity and enable communities to participate in the arts, is huge, which is one reason why we will argue for a different tax policy in the upcoming budget. Um, alongside the pressures we see in Scotland, the approach taken by the Tory government, and that's why I was astonished by the claims made by John Lamont about the arts flourishing under the UK government, because what we're actually seeing across the UK is drastic cuts to local arts provision across the UK regions. And as we leave the EU, the support offered and the exchanges available will be further reduced. And this will all have an impact on the engagement people have with the arts and their ability to create and participate in the arts within Scotland. Uh, this is a time when the UK government is struggling to come up with any answers uh, to the questions over our future. And as the focus of the debate remains the single market, trade, security, and we hear reports of concerns over a civil servant capacity in dealing with all these issues, it is legitimate to be concerned about the future of our creative industries and tourism, whether it will get the scrutiny that it needs and deserves. And alongside the work that has been done in this parliament by our committees, I am pleased to see that the Culture, Media and Sport Committee at the UK Parliament is conducting an inquiry into the impact of Brexit on the creative industries, tourism and the digital single market and will start taking evidence in the new year. Now, by just having a look at some of the evidence they have already received, there are clearly complexities that need to be addressed and with broadcasting having unique pressures. And for example, the British Screen Advisory Council highlight the importance of UK content continuing to meet the requirements to qualify as European works post-Brexit by remaining a signatory to the European Convention on Trans sorry, Transfr Transfrontier Television. So the single digital market has transformed the way that we buy, sell, communicate across the UK. The UK digital market is worth €118 billion Euros a year and 43% of UK digital exports go to the EU. And while this is dominated by the single trade market, it is also about innovation, about shared content, research, knowledge transfer and a consistent and fair copywriting system which recognises new technologies. And my colleague Catherine Styler, MEP, has been doing a lot of work in this area, particularly campaigning for comprehensive digital access for public libraries. All this work and influence is being put at risk by leaving the EU. Um, already we see that tourism faces huge challenges in so many areas. Uh, the future workforce, the fluctuation of currency, the ending of European development funding, which is often very important for the uh, viability of rural tourism, uh, potential restrictions on visitors and visas for travel. And I was speaking to the Fife Chamber of Commerce on Friday, and while it's recognised that Brexit is causing great uncertainty and that the immediate impact of rising costs is cancelling at any benefits that come in for exports, there was a suggestion that inward and tourism could benefit from the weakening of the currency, and there was at this point in time a promotional opportunity that shouldn't be missed. But we can't forget about outward tourism sector and the tour operators within the UK who will be facing significant challenges with their products. So while there may be short-term advantage for tourism, the long term is much more uncertain. And it'd be interesting to hear the Cabinet Secretary's views on this. Um, Presiding Officer, the culture community was one of the most vocal in supporting membership of the EU and polling suggests that a huge majority of, the, of them voted to remain. Uh, the arts know no boundaries, they are internationalist and inclusive. And as others have said, next year celebrates 70 years of the Edinburgh International Festival and started in the wake of the Second World War in 1947. The festival had a remit to provide a platform for the flowering of the human spirit. It is internationalist, celebratory, challenging and increasingly focused on inclusivity, staging more public performances. It brings together culture from all around the world as yet unknown changes to the freedom of movement of people across the UK, sorry, the EU, creates uncertainty and worry. And removing free movement of EU nationals will restrict cultural exchange and collaboration. It will also potentially impact on the audiences for the festivals. And I recognise that many of the performers and visitors who currently come from further afield in the EU, and there is a system of visas and permits, but to have this for all non-UK performers will add to the complexity, the bureaucracy and the cost of staging the International Festival in Fringe, alongside many other festivals in Scotland. It stands to have a negative impact on the breadth, the depth and the quality of our festivals. 
It's also about the message that the result sends. And for those of us who value a diverse society, who welcome people who choose to make their lives here in the UK, who believe that a good balance can be found to encourage immigration and support our values and our communities, the result of this vote has been worrying and some of the reasons for the result are troubling. Culture is about who we are, but it is not uniform. It is not homogeneous. It tells and interprets many stories. Expression will not end with Brexit. It will respond. Uh, we need to listen. It can offer all of us a way through these difficult times. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Call Marie Todd to be followed by Tavish Scott. Ms Todd, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Moran Tang, many thanks. It's Gaelic Week in the Scottish Parliament, so I want to take the opportunity to highlight the contribution that the Gaelic language makes to our culture, our creative industries and tourism. Our Gaelic language is central to our culture, and the EU, of course, recognises the language formally and supports and protects it under the European Charter of Minority Languages. As well as the cultural and community benefits of Gaelic, the economic benefit of Gaelic is now well known, using bilingual branding and signage adds value and authenticity to products and services and improves customers' perceptions of provenance worth nearly 150 million a year to our economy. Gaelic can also be viewed and used as an asset in a range of fields, particularly the sectors of creative industries, food and drink, education and learning, heritage and tourism. I was struck when I was preparing the speech and thinking about what to say that there is a sense of egalitarianism very central to the European project. The EU doesn't disadvantage those on the periphery. It doesn't disadvantage minority languages. It doesn't disadvantage those living in rural areas. And this is trans translated into massive support for infrastructure projects all around the Highlands and Islands and ensuring those of us in rural areas have the same opportunity to participate as those in cities. Leader funding, which of course comes from the EU, has made a real difference to those of us who live and work in rural areas. The bottom-up methodology has harnessed people's vision and energy and commitment, and some of the rural uh, communities have come alive again. The tourism industry is absolutely crucial to the economy of the Highlands and Islands proportionally much more so than the rest of Scotland. When we consider tourism, a couple of phrases spring to mind. Cúd milia falche, a hundred thousand welcomes, and falche gualaba, welcome to Scotland. Even those of us who don't speak Gaelic, like myself, know those phrases. And in a way, those words are very reflective of why our place in the EU is so important. We're a welcoming country, known for our hospitality, and we are keen to share our culture with our friends and our neighbours in the world. We have many world-class attractions that attract visitors from all across the globe. In my constituency, nearly 350,000 people a year come to visit Achert Castle. 140,000 people go to visit the Orkney Italian Chapel every year. Annually, more than a million visitors come and supplement our local expenditure. A strong tourism centre in the Highlands sector in the Highlands and Islands can help create much more resilient communities. If we get it right, tourism helps to support a vibrant regional identity and attracts people to live, work, invest and visit our region. Globally, tourism is one of the large, world's largest industries in terms of outputs and it creates some 8% of the jobs worldwide, expanding annually at the rate of 4-5%. The Highland region is home to some of the world's finest food and drink producers, famous for fine malt whisky, outstanding seafood, world-class meat and game. The industry in the Highlands is a huge employer and generates a turnover in excess of a billion each year. The last thing we need is to be putting up barriers, trade barriers or barriers to people to come and visit us a market of nearly 500 million we need to remain open to. Many of my constituents are worried about the restrictions on the four fundamental freedoms of the EU, but in particular we're worried about the restriction on the freedom of movement, movement because we think it will be damaging to tourism, both in terms of the visitors who are able to come and the people working in tourism. If you come up to the Highlands and Islands and visit, you will meet plenty of new Scots working in the tourist industry. 
I've just been up in Shetland where I heard of several businesses where more than half of the workforce are EU citizens. If these people don't stay or are <coughs> unable to stay, the, there are no Shetlanders to take over from them and the businesses have really serious concerns about future staffing. Last week, I spoke about the positive changes that the Scottish Government's made to in terms of travelling to the islands. RET has made the Western Isles much more accessible, and there's a price freeze on the ferry routes to Orkney and Shetland. For my constituents in the islands, it's one step forward thanks to the Scottish Government and two steps back thanks to Brexit as the islands become more accessible and the UK less. Let's keep the door open and ensure that these visitors are welcome at our tables. EU membership supports culture, tourism and creative industries, all of which are absolutely vital to the Highlands and Islands. Why should the people of the Highlands and Islands suffer the consequences of a Brexit that they didn't vote for? Why should our economy be weakened because of a Brexit that we didn't vote for? Why? We did not vote to become poorer. In fact, why should any part of Scotland lose out on the benefits of EU membership when every single part of Scotland has voted to remain a member? I don't think it's fair to my constituents or to the rest of the people in Scotland to be taken out of the EU against our will. So I believe that all of us here, as representatives of the people of Scotland, must do everything in our power to ensure that our current relationship with the EU is not lost. Morantan. Uh, Tappy Love, Ms Todd, I hope I've got that correct, thank you. Uh, Tavi Scott, to be followed by Tom Arthur, please, Mr Scott. Thank, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Well, uh, another Tuesday afternoon, and it is indeed the 12th uh, debate, but the Tory position gets harder every week. I mean, in many ways, we're grateful to them because it certainly livens up these, uh, uh, these proceedings. Last week, I heard nothing but Rhys Mogg and Ian Duncan Smith, and today we had Jackson Carlaw giving it the same, uh, the, the same position. And it's very clear now, you know, if you dare to question the fact that, and there are facts, uh, that, the, that leaving the European Union in hard Brexit terms is going to be damaging to the UK and damaging to the uh, economy, you get the kind of Rhys Mogg, J, the, uh, Duncan Smith treatment, um, which is how dare you even suggest such a thing, the only way is up. Uh, I mean, the breathtaking naivety of, of that, uh, uh, you just need to read any uh, decent account of what's going on at the moment to, uh, to question um, the Tory position at the moment. Actually, I thought, in fairness to Douglas Ross, he was mentioned as going to do a wind-up today. I suppose Douglas will be the only one who will welcome staying in the European. He'll be the only Tory left in Europe after we've left, because he'll, be he'll still be refereeing on Wednesday nights across in Madrid. But, uh, um, and Good luck, to him, uh, good luck to him on that. But I must say, for Jackson Carlaw to accuse others of blunderbusting when the Foreign Secretary of this country goes round the world in the way in which Boris Johnson does, um, takes, uh, takes a breath away. Quite uh, breathtaking from the Conservatives today. And, and uh, Stuart Merrill was quite right about clarity. It's no good um, John Lamont lecturing any, any other government, any, any other part of the United Kingdom on clarity. The clarity that this country needs is the clarity of the negotiating position on Brexit. And it, it, it now appears to be um, eat your cake or have some cake or whatever's going on with cake. It seems to be the only uh, game in town uh, at the moment. Uh, that is uh, a true indictment. Of, um, uh, of a government that uh, haven't a clue as to what their position is, uh, not least of which because the infighting is, is not between the Labour Party, the SNP, the Liberal Democrats and, and others and the Tories. It's within the Conservative Party. It has been from day one. It's actually been going on for about 40 years now, as far as I can remember, and it continues and it continues and it continues. And until they get that sorted out, if, if, if John Lamont wants to explain to me 40 years of Conservative splits on Europe, he can take all afternoon... <laughs> John Lamont. I'm just th th I'm th I thank the member for um, giving way. When Mingus Campbell, leader of the Lib Dems, proposed a referendum on leaving the EU, what was his position going to be had the British people delivered that verdict they've now delivered? Tavish Scott. That's got to do with 40 years of Tory splits on, on, on Europe. And I get, I get, I, I'll give way again if John Lamont wants to tell us uh, what the latest co Conservative position is, because actually we're not dealing with Ming Campbell's leadership, which was some years ago, Mr Lamont. We're dealing with the Conservative position of the government of our country right uh, now. And it would be really helpful if you would address that. And we'll wait for Douglas to wind up to tell us all what the Conservative position is going to be today, tomorrow. Goodness knows uh, what. Day. I suppose the other upside to this debate is that it's reawakened many of 
our interests in European politics, because actually uh, the interest uh, this week has to be on the Italian referendum on Sunday and what happens to the Prime Minister of uh, Italy in that, which has profound implications for um, uh, the European uh, Union. Uh, just as the decision by the centre-right part of French politics, and I'm not sure I even understand um, uh, this in, in any sense, uh, to select uh, Monsieur Fillon as their candidate who will presumably take on the very, the very clever nationalism that is Marine Le Pen uh, next uh, spring. And of course, just the other day, just the last week, Mer uh, Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor, announced she was running again. Thank goodness is all I can say to that, because she's about the most stable, uh, sensible politician in the whole of European uh, politics. And uh, not that an endorsement from me will make any blind bit of difference, thank goodness, but I darn well hope she wins because the, the European Union will be a stronger place uh, were she to do so. Uh, I just wanted to make a, a couple of points uh, on the economics that are underpin what I thought from uh, the Cabinet Secretary, from Claire Baker and indeed from Ash Denham and others about the importance of the cultural tourism and other sectors uh, were important and I can't better those arguments. I think there are uh, some other points around, for example, Erasmus, which seem to me quite important about, uh, about the numbers, but there are plenty of stats out there and we can trade them around all day. The Conservatives will disagree with them because clearly they support an argument which says the European Union is important and the rest of us may take a, and do take, thankfully, a, a different view. But what cannot be argued in terms of what happened last week was that the Conservatives' own Chancellor blew a hole in their Brexit strategy because what he said to his party as well as to the rest of the House of Commons was the reality of the um, public finances, which of course underpins the spending on um, arts, as uh, Claire Baker was rightly pointing out. It's not just being cut in, in terms of um, what's happening in Scotland, but of course it's been cut in every part of England as well, a point made to me by uh, some cousins in the West Country just the other day. But what, of course, the Chancellor pointed out, based on, the analysis, uh, based on his own analysis and more to the point, the analysis provided by uh, independent, and yes, they are experts, and therefore they should actually be listened to rather than dismissed, which of course is the standard position we get now, is that there's a £59 billion hole in the public finances over the next five years. Now, it doesn't matter uh, whether you think the government is right or wrong in Scotland or right or wrong on health or education. It doesn't, it, the, the fact is there will be less public money uh, to spend on the arts, to spend on tourism, to spend on culture, and indeed to spend on other public services. Those are, these are the figures that the Conservative government have produced themselves. Uh, so to come here today and give us all a, a lecture about spending on in this and spending on that when their own Chancellor has uh, illustrated dramatically the impact of Brexit on the, on the UK economy over the next five years couldn't be clearer. So if we get one thing from the Tories today in the wind-ups, maybe it'll be an acceptance that their own Chancellor uh, laid low what the dire financial position uh, is and how difficult that will be for every government across Across, these, uh, across the uh, nations and regions of the, uh, of the United uh, Kingdom. Uh, not only that, but the Institute of Fiscal Studies backed up the Chancellor by uh, pointing to the falling pound driving up inflation and that Brexit was causing the biggest squeeze in pay, in take-home pay for the people we represent here in uh, Edinburgh and, and the people that are represented by MPs down in the House of Commons as well for 70 years. Uh, and so as to simply ignore that, to brush it under the table, seems to me uh, to uh, not be prepared to accept the, the, the facts that um, the Conservatives' own Chancellor presented to the House of Commons uh, just uh, last week. Uh, two final points, if I may. It seems to me that the intervention of Mark Carney last, uh, on Sunday uh, is, the, is, is the most important one that's knocking around on this Brexit debate at the moment, because what he said is that uh, there needs to be transitional relief and it needs to be two years longer uh, and we need to work really hard to make sure that happens. Thankfully, the, the Tories can't sack Mark Carney because there'd be a run on the pound if they did. Um, he, is, uh, uh, he is unmovable in that sense and that is, uh, to the, to the, for the rest of us, a great relief. And the other, I thought, really telling uh, remark in the last few days was that uh, Brian Kerr, who must be one of the most experienced UK-EU negotiators, said that there was less than a 50% chance of securing an orderly Brexit within those two years and there was a possible decade of uncertainty. That's the Mark Carney point, that the longer that can be used, the longer pe time period that can be used in negotiating a transitional plan does give some uh, opportunity to, an opportunity is the wrong word, but some um, ability to uh, ensure that uh, single market access is retained and therefore the public finances, which are dire, uh, will, uh, can uh, have some semblance of structure underneath them, which would, it would complete the circle by allowing us to invest in in the very uh, art, culture and other areas that 
that have been introduced uh, this afternoon. Lewis, uh, uh, Lewis MacDonald quoted Donald Dewar, uh, we, how we are and how we carry ourselves. I think Donald would uh, be pretty depressed by what we've heard today from the Tory benches. Thank you very much, Mr Scott. Call Tom Arthur to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Mr Arthur, please. So as I rise to uh, speak in today's debate, I am conscious that it is now six months since I first spoke in this parliament. And uh, in those six months, we have witnessed perhaps, uh, we have witnessed greater political turbulence across the globe than at any point in this parliament's history, and certainly since the fall of the Berlin Wall. In my first speech, I argued that the European Union is more than simply the sum of various treaties and trade agreements. I stated my belief that our European citizenship gives expression to our ancient sense of European identity. At the heart of that shared identity, I believe they are a shared set of values and, crucially, a shared culture. I'm therefore grateful to have the opportunity to contribute to this afternoon's debate, which, in its consideration of culture, permits a discussion of the great anchors of our European civilization and what I believe constitutes our European identity. However, before considering the uh, cultural dimension of our, our relationship with Europe and the European Union, I do wish to very briefly comment on the uh, nature of the uh, debate over the past few months. When considering the implications of Brexit, it has become all too easy to be ensnared in a debate exclusively about trade. While retaining full membership of the single market must be the prime objective of this government, the fundamental reasons for wishing to retain membership transcend the obvious benefits of the four fundamental freedoms. Simply put, the idea and realisation of the single market has been the scaffolding that has supported peace, stability and democracy in post-war Europe. However, the foundations of this shared peace and prosperity have been a shared culture, identity and values. Presiding officer, it has been said in this chamber by some that leaving the EU does not mean leaving Europe. However, unfortunately, I think this only applies in a strictly geographic sense. The manner in which the Leave campaign was conducted and the attitude of many prominent Brexiteers imply a rejection not only of the EU, but of the very idea of Europe. At least since Roman times, Britain has had an ongoing relationship with our neighbours on the continent. This relationship has been defined and influenced by a range of institutions and treaties. The Roman Empire, the Catholic Church, the Hanseatic League, the Concert of Europe and the political familial connections of royal, royal households are perhaps a few of the most prominent. While no one of those august bodies achieved permanence as a political force or enjoyed parity of influence across the continent, their existence and history demonstrates a long-standing willingness to employ not just force but discourse in fostering inter-European engagement. The many endeavours of European cooperation, which predate the European Union, grew in the fertile soil of a shared cultural identity and heritage, while themselves facilitating the exchange of new ideas. While there are many aspects and manifestations to this shared identity and culture, such as the linguistic, the literary and the religious, I would like to turn to the one that I think most relevant to this afternoon's debate and the current state of affairs. namely the values of the Enlightenment. It is the values of the Enlightenment that are embodied in the project of European unity. Democracy, liberty, secularism, rationality, freedom of expression, the belief that the human condition can be improved. We know that to truly realise such ambitions is our greatest challenge, but we know equally that they are what defines us as Europeans. They are our heritage and they have been our gift to the world. They have informed the constitutions and the cultures of countless republics and democracies across the globe. The campaign to leave Europe was a repudiation of these values, a rejection of the idea of Europe. It was a campaign that dismissed fact, denigrated experts and trafficked in the politics of division and xenophobia. The one million Scots who voted to leave did so for a variety of reasons. I spoke to many in my own constituency of Renfrewshire South who felt neglected and alienated by the political process and saw the EU as an irrelevancy. We must listen to and we must engage with those people. But while I feel regret 
in not persuading more of my fellow Scots of the, of the case for the EU. I feel nothing but contempt for many of the principal architects of the deceitful and xenophobic Leave campaign. We need only consider those who so loudly promoted and preached for the diplomatic disaster of a Leave vote. A dismal ensemble of the unthinking Beyond Pong Song right and the isolationist left, and a ghastly embrace with those vultures of a new counter enlightenment, Farage and Johnston. When the result of the EU referendum became apparent, I felt that something fundamental had been stripped away from me, not just from me, but also from future generations. And I must add, as a new and young member of this parliament, it has been a sobering and disillusioning experience to witness how glibly and superficial some other members in this place treat what is a tragedy. And the consequences of this tragedy are incalculable. The liberal world order is buckling. The centre is struggling to hold. The far right now menaces our great democracies. Presiding officer, I believe that we are approaching a period of great danger as the global order continues to destabilise. Our influence in this place is limited, but where we can bring it to bear, we must. Brexit bromides are no substitute for a coherent plan from the UK government. Britain cannot have its cake and eat it. A hard, a hard Brexit will not only undermine our own economy, it could, and its disavowal of European culture and values, act as a fillip to fascism on the continent. The Westminster government faces a choice. It can recognise our shared culture and values by reaffirming our commitment to European partnership, by committing the UK to full membership of the single market with freedom of movement or it can heed the siren calls of British exceptionalism, undermine our European partners, reject our shared culture and values, and sleepwalk us into catastrophe. Should the latter seem likely to prevail, then Scotland must reaffirm its European values independently. Thank you. Rachel Hamilton, to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Ms Hamilton, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I refer members to my interest, register of interest in the fact that I own a hotel. Tom Arthur is uh, suffering from Brexit phobia, I think, um, but this has gripped the Scottish Government almost to the point of forgetting what our day job is. The fear of Scotland exiting Europe has become the su subtitle to every motion that we find ourselves debating. Scottish businesses, on the other hand, are preparing the ground ahead for change. Tourism is vitally important to Scotland, and I'd like to thank those who work day in, day out in the tourism industry to help drive the Scottish economy. It's business as usual for us and them. After all, people's livelihoods depend on offering high quality, creative and innovative attractions and ensuring visitors receive a warm welcome. At this point, we must congratulate South of Scotland regional winners, Born in the Borders and Galloway Activity Centre for innovative innovation in tourism at the latest Thistle Awards ceremony. Go on then. Oh, I think it a nicer way of saying it, Ms. Hamilton. I appreciate, uh, Stuart I appreciate Rachel Hamilton taking the, the brief intervention. Just that in terms of welcoming visitors uh, to the country, uh, does, the, does Rachel Hamilton agree uh, with the UK government's proposal to have the face-to-face -face passport control checks on the cruise liners when they, when they enter into UK waters? I'm Ms. afraid Hamilton. I don't have many cruise liners in the south of Scotland, but um, if I just refer to my own business, the um, welcome that we've been receiving has actually increased in terms of, of what we offer to our European friends and uh, our business has increased because we are welcoming and we offer a really good service in Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Deputy yeah. Presiding Officer, our European Committee programme has seen us taking evidence from different sectors of Scottish businesses. Their key message is that the worst risk to business is uncertainty. As I've said, I'm a business owner in the hospitality industry and can back that statement up. Businesses want to hear that governments are supportive and will be prepared to pull fiscal levers if necessary. Cutting interest rates, for example, made borrowing a little cheaper in the first week after the EU referendum. Last week's announcement that Scotland will receive an extra £800 million for infrastructure and innovation projects to boost productivity and long-term economic growth is the type of message that gives the tourism industry confidence. Let's examine the depreciation of sterling after the EU referendum. In the short term, the low value of the pound has been an incentive to overseas travellers. It's been viewed by the tourism industry as a boost. 
Tourism spending in Scotland recorded the highest second quarter figures, with international tourist spending breaking through the £500 million barrier. This increase in expenditure benefits the whole economy, including retail and wider still. Furthermore, both Glasgow and Edinburgh airports have seen significant increases in pas passenger numbers, with international visitors up 9.4% at Glasgow Airport in July this year. Secondly, Scotland is seen as a safe place following terrorist incidents in traditional European short break destinations. People are concerned about security and safety and are avoiding a number of European cities, choosing to travel to Scotland or the rest of the UK, for example. Equally, Brits are opting for safer destinations, many trying a staycation for the first time. Not forgetting tourism is performing well because Scotland is a world-class destination. Members may have found themselves caught like Jackson Carlow in the mystical and spellbinding Outlander saga enjoyed too by millions of viewers, indeed a worldwide success. Scotland has shown that it can offer the perfect backdrop for authors and TV producers to work their magic amongst the ancient and mysterious standing stones in Dumfries and Galloway to dramatic castles, magnificent stately homes such as Gosford House in East Lothian and breathtaking landscapes. So-called screen tourism is now worth millions to the Scottish economy and tourism bosses believe benefits from the long-running success of Outlander could outstrip mainstream blockbuster movies. I recently visited Thelston Castle near Lauder, one of the oldest and most impressive castles in Scotland. I saw firsthand the great work done there. Historic buildings like these have helped to welcome nearly 15 million overnight tourism trips in Scotland in 2015, for which visitor expenditure totaled over 5 billion. 124 million day visits were taken in Scotland in 2015, with a total spend of 3.9 billion. However, we understand that preserving historic attractions to ensure they remain prominent tourist attractions is a huge challenge and preserving them must be on the Brexit wish list. Fiona Hislop said it herself, Brexit hasn't happened, which means we need to concentrate on the here and now. The tourism industry makes up 7.7% of Scotland's workforce. We talk a lot about skills gaps in this parliament. Fiona Hislop's motion talks of the severe negative impact that Brexit could have on staffing and skills. I visited Dumfries and Galloway College last week and we spoke about the flexible and blended learning opportunities they offer school leavers from Langham to Stranra and from Kirkconnell to Gretna. Brexit wasn't mentioned once. Skills Development Scotland have identified a skills gap in the tourism industry and the hos and do you want to okay. Cabinet Secretary. Does the member agree with the Chief Executive of Scottish Tourism Alliance, Mark Crotho, who said today, one of the critical issues for industry is the potential changes to the free movement of people, which will directly affect our skills ability to attract, employ and retain overseas staff, both seasonal and permanent. I recognise there will be a regional difference of demand across the country, but does she agree with that very important criticism and concern that has come from the Scottish Tourism Rachel Alliance? Rachel Hamilton, please. I thank the member for her intervention. I, I don't believe that it was a criticism by Mark Crothall. I think he's merely pointing out that uh, Scotland uh, has a need to bring in more people to this country to make it a success. And yes, there is a number of people who work within that industry who we're not skilling up. And unfortunately, we have to make sure that we skill people up. Young school leavers um, need to, we need to get into schools and we need to ensure that hospitality businesses, tourism businesses are communicating their needs just like skills development Scotland are. There is a skills gap and we need to ensure that we, 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 we narrow that gap with our own people and then... Oh, God. Okay. What, what about... Todd, can I, see a wee minute, can I just have less casual... I, I realise you're under a wee bit of pressure, but okay, perhaps, and all that, just a little more. Can I, can I ask what your suggestion would be yes. in communities where there aren't? Yes, Mr. Carlo, charm of which you have an abundance. <laughs> <laughs> can I ask what your suggestion would be for those communities, for example, the island communities which I, which I mentioned, which don't have people to upskill to work in their tourism se sector, which are heavily dependent on EU citizens who come and work in the food and drink, which is absolutely, absolutely vital to the economy that I live in. Ms Hamilton. I can speak again from experience. We employ 52 people and they're all local. We discussed connectivity, road and rail transport, data download speeds and Wi-Fi. This college has had to get special derogation from the Funding Council to allow them to use money from their pot 
to fund buses to ferry pupils to colleges. The rural location of the colleges poses challenges. Dumfries and Galloway College have upgraded to a broadband system called SWAN, so that pupils have access to fast download speeds. Of course, this all falls apart when they head home and they can't even get a mobile signal. In summary, it would be helpful for the Scottish Government to stop doom-mongering and give tourism businesses the reassurance they need. In 2008, tourism businesses either sank or swam. Those that survived the economic crisis are strong and resilient business structures and able to survive. We also survived the uncertainty of an independence referendum. The future success of Scotland's economy depends upon growth and competitiveness. The Scottish Government's tourism strategy should therefore deliver a business environment that supports growth. Perhaps the Cabinet Secretary would consider that we need to refresh the strategy in light of the opportunities and challenges that lie ahead. Scotland's tourism and creative industries are growing sectors and should be supported by the Scottish Government to enable each and every one to survive. Thank you very much. I call Joan McAlpine to be followed by Jamie Green. Ms McAlpine, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, the thrust of Jackson Carlaw's speech seemed entirely premised on the argument that Scotland should get back in its box and not make its voice heard on the world stage. And while it might be amusing to compare the First Minister with a, well, a, First Minister with a democratic mandate to the wife of the Argentinian strongman Juan Perón, uh, many will consider it insulting. Uh, having said that, Evita was wildly popular in Argentina in the 1940s, uh, enjoying the kind of support that the Scottish Conservatives can only dream about. So perhaps that's where Mr Carlo got the comparison from. Uh, to return to the motion in hand, Scotland has a long history of cultural cross-fertilisation with Europe and we're all familiar and others have spoken about the Scottish Enlightenment period in the 18th century which saw great flourishing of inter intellectual exchange with Europe. But as far back as the, the 13th century, Scots in search of a university education have gone to the continent, uh, especially to Paris. And by the 17th century, they were looking to the Netherlands for ideas and education. Um, uh, with around 1,500 Scots, for example, enrolled in Leiden University in the 17th century. And at that time, there was 30,000 Scots uh, living in Poland, particularly Krakow. Even the Scots language has European roots with links to German, Norwegian uh, and Dutch, as well as Old English. So while there's considerable financial and organisational arguments for Scotland to maintain the closest possible ties with Europe, uh, this is also about the type of country we wish to be. As has been said already, the cultural sector wish to look outward, to cross-fertilise with a myriad of different people and cultural traditions, including in the UK, but far beyond that. What we're being offered is a narrowing and limiting of auctions to be marooned in the island of Britain with people who still haven't got over the decline of the British Empire and whose idea of art seems to be painting the atlas red again. Uh, Presiding Officer, Creative Scotland, in the wake of the referendum vote, surveyed cultural organisations about their views on the result and what it meant for them in 188 responded. 40% had received European Union linked funding uh, in the past. A total of a million euros plus was reported. But even more important than the funding uh, from those who responded was partnership working. And they gave details of collaborations with as many as 14 countries, including Bulgaria, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, Germany, Iceland, and further afield. Others, including the Cabinet Secretary, have quoted Fergus Lynham, the director of the Edinburgh International Festival, and has expressed fear that the political trend of battening down the hatches was antithetical to the internationalism of the festival. That battening down of the hatches comment almost certainly also refers to the situation in America, where we're seeing the rise of an authoritarian philistinism, which the Conservative Party today suggested that the American people should just bow down and put up with by putting on their big boy pants. I do realise that the Trump age has resulted in what people are calling a post-truth era where facts and expertise must be ignored in favour of crass assertions. But I must say that I'm disappointed that, that Jackson Carlaw has adopted this post-truth approach as I had always considered him to be one of the more thoughtful and less zealous members of the Conservative benches. 
Um, but how can we consider um, the dismissal by, by the Tories of so much expert opinion in the field of culture as anything other than post-truth? Uh, the submission of uh, the European, uh, to the European and External Relations Committee by the organisation Culture Counts reflects on the survey uh, conducted by Creative Scotland and indeed its own members. And it will be dismissed by the post-truthers as whinging, no doubt. But I, for one, respect the views of experts like Culture Counts who engage with this parliament and who really value the parliamentary time we have devoted to matters which concern their sectors. And in their submission, they outline very, very clearly um, five areas where they're very, very concerned about the future of the cultural sector. Um, they are particularly concerned about the protection of the right to take part in cultural life as a human right. And this is protected by the current EU law. Uh, we don't know if it will continue post-Brexit, will it? Free movement of people. Culture Counts points out that the EU nationals still don't know their status. When will the UK government tell them? Free trade. The EU is the largest export market for UK creative industries. How will they feature in any deal? How will they be affected by tariffs or non-tariff barriers? The UK government has provided no clarity. Funding, as has already been uh, described in detail, Creative Europe's funds affect a myriad of projects from the Scottish Poetry Library to the Scottish Youth Dance Theatre. How will these funds be re replaced? Will they be replaced? Again, it's a matter for the UK government, but answers there are none. Finally, international relations. Culture Counts talks of the need to put the nation on the map for visitors and investors across the EU. What does Brexit say to them? What does it say about our attitude to our international partners? I think another Conservative, um, Chris Payton, put it best in his article in The Guardian on the 7th of June this year. He asked, what is Brexit's message to the world? And he answered, two fingers. Or, as he went on to say, perhaps it would be more appropriate to use the terrorist chant of the Millwall football crowd. No one's like us and we don't care. That presiding officer is the cultural cry of the Brexiteers and it is a very ugly sound indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I move on to the next speaker, can I say to the closing uh, speakers, there's time in hand so you can add a couple of minutes on to your closing speeches. I know you enjoy that. Uh, I call Jamie Green to be followed Ruth Maguire, and Ruth Maguire will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Green, please. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I uh, hope my colleagues across the chamber will excuse my croakiness. It's nothing to do with the fact this is the 12th debate we've had on the EU. It's just general man flu, so apologies. I'll struggle through. Uh, it is quite clear, however, that this debate has been called uh, not because the Scottish Government has any real concerns over the impact of Brexit on the Scottish creative and tourism industries, but because instead of, in, instead of debating legislation and addressing the real issues that face our country today, the Scottish Parliament is being forced once again to play the big bad Brexit bad game. And given that my uh, colleague Mr Arthur declined any intervention uh, during his uh, very elegant uh, speech, uh, I do wonder though if he has a view that a Scottish Leave voter is any different from an English Leave voter, or do they deserve a similar or different outcome to the vote that we had uh, this year? Uh, I'd be very happy to give way if he wanted to clarify his position on that. Mr. I appreciate Arthur. you allowed me to get away. It comes down very simply to democracy. A majority of people in Scotland voted to remain as they did in my constituency. In England, they didn't. Mr. And perhaps we have different. Uh, perhaps we have different uh, ideas of what democracy is, because I think we voted as a United Kingdom, and the result was uh, overwhelmingly in the majority. So. Uh, I, I, no, I won't. I'd like to make some progress. Thank you very much. I appreciate it's very clear in this debate and the number of debates we've had about Brexit recently that there is uh, a, a lot of heated debate and winds are still very fresh. I actually am uh, genuinely inspired by the enthusiasm shown by Mr Arthur in his speech. He's generally very angry as a Remainer that the rest of the country voted to leave. And I can see that that enthusiasm uh, and anger is coming through in his speech. It was, it was apparent. However, I think we need to be a little bit more optimistic about the future in Scotland. And I think it's about time that the language coming from this chamber was more optimistic about the future in Scotland. 
Now, look, much has been said uh, by my colleagues on tourism. I really think there's nothing to suggest that tourism is going to be eternally uh, dented by the UK choosing to leave a political union such as the European Union. Uh, I think just as we will always want to visit uh, the continent, to climb the Eiffel Tower, to go on our holidays and lie on the beaches of southern Spain, our friends in Europe will still want to come here and see our beautiful highlands and islands. They'll still want to come and play golf. They'll still want to come and cycle around Millport and shop on the Royal Mile. In fact, the Scottish Tourism Alliance has pointed out that the current weaker pound is pu uh, proving a huge incentive for Europeans to come to the UK and shop in numbers that we haven't seen in decades. I'd like to make some progress. Far from the doom and the gloom coming from the centre benches, the figures from UK inbound show that tourism has been performing extremely well since June. So it seems that, not surprisingly, people from around the globe are still keen to come and visit our country. So let's look at, uh, no, I'd like to make some progress, please. Uh, so let's look at the government motion today, which states that to protect, to protect our cultural tourist sectors, there must be free movement of people. But, presiding officer, freedom, freedom to live and work permanently in a country is not the same thing as freedom to visit and enjoy a country. Uh, and I think that the SNP either doesn't understand that distinction or they are deliberately fudging the lines. So let's talk about... I show. Cabinet Secretary, throughout my opening speech, I made it clear our focus was particularly around freedom of movement to ensure that the tourism sector can be fully and properly staffed, with 17% of the tourism sector uh, being staffed by EU nationals. That is a genuine real issue. Genuine real issue. Could you engage on that point, please? Mr. Green. Do I, I, you know what? The, the Minister makes a, 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 a very important point. Uh, the, the, a, a chunk of... Um, that industry uh, we are uh, recruiting from overseas. Uh, I don't think anyone on this side of the chamber is in any doubt as to the importance of those people, or are we undermining the value of the work they deliver? Do I have the answers to what will happen in the future post-Brexit? Uh, no, I don't think any of us do. That's why we're having these debates. I cannot undermine the outcome of the negotiation until the negotiation has actually taken place. Uh, you, you sh we should bear in mind that there are millions of Brits living in Europe itself, and they are equally as important in this discussion. And I think that is often forgot when we have these debates. Uh, I, 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 Jackson said I would, uh, Jackson Carlow said I would talk about the digital uh, uh, issues, and I think uh, uh, there's lots we could say on this. Uh, if I may, if I may uh, continue on uh, the digital single market, I, I think it is an area that's very close to my heart uh, in a previous uh, life before coming to this parliament. So I would like to discuss it if we have a, a, a few uh, moments. Um, I, I think the idea that our creative industries are entirely dependent on this political membership of the EU is actually quite uh, absurd. Um, I think uh, Scotland can influence the digital single market, along with the UK, because it is such a leading player in this industry. You only need to look at the EU's own scorecards that repeatedly put the UK at the top in terms of connectivity, skills and our internet economy. In fact, in the G20, our internet economy is the highest. Uh, so I think if the Scottish Government has very specific requirements around the digital single market, then they should work with the UK Government so that these can be included in the negotiation. And I absolutely welcome any comments from uh, uh, the Government that they will do that with the UK, who is the negotiating partner in this situation. But the digital single market is not all perfect either, and I think that's another speech for another day, and we're very happy to debate that and, and discuss that with the Scottish Government. Uh, there are many concerns about areas of the DSM which uh, I don't think work for the UK. There's huge discussions around data protection, IP ownership, uh, GDPR, geo-blocking free content that's paid for uh, by UK licensed pairs and so on. So I don't think the uh, grass is entirely always greener in the European side, and there are member states within that market uh, who... Uh, uh, who have concerns as well. So, if, it's, uh, if we have time. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. I, I think those points are particularly well made. It's exactly what this debate should be about, to make sure that in terms of shaping the digital single market, either before the UK leaves or certainly even during, it's absolutely vital that there, we help shape that, because if we don't, it will be shaped for us, and it might not be in the way that either the creative industries in Scotland or the UK as a whole would like.
Mr. Actually, I, I welcome that feedback, and I think um, uh, you know if, if the if, if the Scottish government is willing to accept all ideas and input into that conversation, I'd be very happy to, to put those ideas forward because those are ideas we should be taking alongside our colleagues at DCMS in those discussions and presenting a strong case for what works post Brexit in the digital single market for us. Um, so I, I think I'll, I, I was going to talk about some of the success stories that we see in the digital industry in Scotland. We've had that debate previously and I'm sure I have lots of opportunity in the future. So I will instead conclude by saying that I think that we should work together to protect our creative tourist and uh, digital uh, industries in Scotland. Uh, but I think that the way to do that is not to undermine or forget the importance of our current largest single trading market, and that is the UK, which is why I think our amendment is actually very important, because the UK is the single biggest trading market to Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Green. Uh, Ruth McGuire, please, who is the last speaker in the open debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scotland I hope everyone in this chamber aspires to is inclusive, tolerant and outward looking. And I strongly believe that we're best served by protecting our existing relationship with Europe and the freedom of movement within the EU, which enriches our lives. And if we do want that inclusive, tolerant, outward looking country, welcoming people from across the world, then it's vital that we send a message of welcome and openness. Vital that Scotland makes it clear that we are not represented, whether in Europe or further afield, by a right-wing rabble of Tories intent on a hard Brexit and obsessed by restricting immigrations, immigration. Restrictions that we know could have a catastrophic consequence on our culture and tourism industries. We've heard this afternoon how Scottish cultural and creative organisations have benefited greatly from being able to access the EU's funding programmes, the importance of collaboration and how rising costs and bureaucracy could hamper the ability to co-produce and make connections. We've also heard how fear over loss of funding by EU sources, hindrances to free movement of artists, performers and companies and rising costs are key concerns of the sector. But as important, to, as important as the loss of funding, which would come from a hard Brexit, is the isolationist message that it sends to the world, a message which might deter people from coming here in the first place. Back in October, in the EU debate on higher and further education, we heard how agencies in China and the Far East are already telling students, don't go to Scotland or the UK. It's closed. You should go somewhere else. Closed is not what we want the rest of the world to hear. Brexit hasn't even happened yet, and the signals being sent from Westminster to the rest of the world are clear, and they're not helpful to us here in Scotland. Perhaps now more than ever, presiding officer, I recognise the importance of Scotland speaking with our own voice on the international stage. And I'm proud of the work that our cabinet secretaries and our first minister are doing. Previous speakers have outlined all the pragmatic and practical reasons why freedom of movement is of key importance to the cultural and creative sector. But as the Cabinet Secretary mentioned in open, opening, we should take a second to consider the very personal enrichment and benefits that come from free movement and the cultural interchange provided through exchanges and collaborations. I'd like to illustrate this with a wee story relating to my own constituency, Cunningham South. This weekend, members of the Irvine Burns Club will welcome Paul McGrattie to Irvine. Paul comes from Paris and first came to Scotland three years ago as part of a study abroad exchange between his university in Paris and St Andrews University here in Scotland. During his time in Scotland, as well as studying English literature at the university, Paul met and fell in love with a Dundonian lass made deep and enduring friendships and developed a passion for the languages, literature and culture of Scotland. Just a few months ago, he returned to St Andrews to begin, to begin a PhD, studying the political uses of Robert Burns in the 20th century. I also know that he's recently written a piece for Bella Caledonia in Scots, describing how he came to know and love Scotland, its language, culture and politics. So Paul will travel to Irvine on Saturday to meet our world famous Irvine Burns Club and share his passion for Burns and learn more about him and his work with like-minded people. 
I'm sure that we all know similar stories of people who came to Scotland for work or study, but then stayed as personal relationships and ties developed. Some of us will also know how fearful some of these people are about their future. Culture may well transcend boundaries and borders, but arguably more important than that, whether you have to get a visa or not, is whether you actually want to go somewhere in the first place, whether you feel welcome. I want people who've chosen to make Scotland their home to hear this loud and clear. You are welcome here. Your contribution is valued for all the reasons outlined over this debate, and more than that, for the personal richness that a multicultural society brings to all our lives. Thank you very much. And we move to closing speeches. And I note there are three members who were in the debate, not in the chamber. And I tell the presiding officers are very tired of repeating this. And we will be discussing what will result from that for members who do just disobey the chair. Oh, well, here we come, the sprinters. Yes. Now, can I say to members rushing to the chamber, I give adequate warning uh, I give on the penultimate speaker, I give a warning on the last speaker, I give a warning and you are lucky. I'm still naming you the people who were not in the chair. Marie Todd, Tavi Scott and Tom Arthur. I'm glad to see you're back in and you've heard what I have to say, but we're not going to continue saying this. It's a discourtesy to the chair. It's a discourtesy to other members in the debate and it's going to stop. I now move to the closing speeches. I call Lewis MacDonald. Mr MacDonald, you have around about eight minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. This afternoon's debate has highlighted some of the risks and costs of Britain leaving the European Union as far as culture, the creative industries and tourism are concerned. On the one hand, we know that any deal on Brexit, including any deal that provides for continuing access to or membership of the single market on whatever terms, will bring to an end our right to have a say in the future development of EU law and EU policy. There is no getting away from that simple fact. No matter how hard anyone may work to keep us as close to Europe as possible, no membership of the EU, no vote in the EU. On the other hand, there are clearly things that can be done to maintain our access to some of the advantages of being part of Europe for Scotland's creative industries, for tourism and for our cultural life. And Tavish Scott rounded up some of the recent developments uh, that show that this is still very much a live debate. Jamie Green raised the digital single market, which is a new initiative and, and perhaps a good place to start. That initiative is seeking to put Europe at the front edge of the digital age to make cross-border e-commerce easier and to address some serious inequalities arising from the free market. Inequalities like unfair charges for parcel delivery to rural and island customers. Like most EU initiatives, it also has the potential to get things wrong by applying the same principles in different countries where circumstances are not the same. Take, for example, BBC iPlayer, where users in the UK now require to pay a TV licence as the rules catch up with technological <coughs> change. That requirement does not and cannot exist across borders, so the British government should be working right now to reduce the impact uh, on public service broadcasting of some of the ru new rules which the Commission will propose or even to exclude it altogether. The good news is that these rules and policies are still developing. So as long as we are a member state in the European Union, we are still in a good position to seek to uh, have those rules shaped to reflect our needs and priorities, as indeed the Cabinet Secretary said in her intervention. The bad news is that our ability to have a say in future such policy developments will be lost, whether we are in or out of the single market, and our credibility, even at this stage, will be sharply reduced the moment we give formal notice to quit. Mr Green. Taking that point, but is he suggesting that upon Brexit that all of these laws uh, and rules and legislations would somehow disappear? Or, uh, you know, the, the, the idea that suddenly the UK government would uh, have to reinvent the wheel from, from scratch, I, I, I don't think that would be the, the, the case, that any good ideas that we make progress on over the next few years, that we actually will inherit and can keep those laws in, in the future. Mr. McDonald, suggesting that, and, and, and I guess the point here is that the digital single market will continue to develop as and when the United Kingdom gives notice to quit. The point is, though, that when we are no longer at the table, 
with a say and with a vote uh, in the development of those policies, they are much less likely to reflect the needs and priorities uh, of the sector in this country. Yes, the digital single market will continue to develop. I hope and suspect it will, be, uh, it will develop successfully, but will, it will develop with us outside it. And therefore, no matter how much we engage with it, we will not be in a position uh, to, to contribute to that debate going forward. And I think that's the critical point. And, and Claire Baker rightly highlighted the cuts to arts funding under the current uh, UK government, and that's the real context in which those ministers are tasked with representing our broadcasters, our creative industries, uh, our cultural sector in the negotiations that lie ahead. Uh, that uh, context is bound to give us cause, to concern, cause for concern. Now, I was uh, intrigued to hear John Lamont quote the views of Alex Neil as uh, evidence of uh, the prospects for our tourism industry. We never learned uh, whether Mr. Lamont shared Mr. Neil's view that Brexit is actually good news for the Scottish tourist sector. Uh, if he does, it would be good to know. Uh, but clearly, for the majority of people in this chamber, we are more concerned today with the threats and the risks that lie ahead uh, rather than opportunities which may come uh, our way, incidentally. Uh, Marie Todd made a, a strong plea not to close any doors on Europe, which I would endorse. But I would say to her that it is even more important uh, for Scottish tourism that no doors should be closed in Britain either. Uh, when the Scottish Tourism Alliance surveyed its members this summer, they found that talk of another referendum on independence was the single greatest cause of uncertainty for their members and the great, single greatest concern uh, looking ahead. It's not a subject on which I intend to wax eloquent this afternoon. Uh, I'm glad that others have not done so either, but I think it is important when we're making the case for an open door policy towards Europe that we recognise fundamental and central to that is an open door policy within these islands. Rachel Hamilton cited quite fairly the short term benefits to Scottish tourism uh, that have come this summer from a weak pound, but clearly a decline in Britain's buying power cannot be a long term plan uh, for the tourism sector uh, or the economy as a whole. And we need to hear more um, from the Conservative benches about what the long term might in their view look like. Of course, Europe as a single market is tightly defined by rules and regulations, but Europe as a cultural construct and as a geographical space offer more scope for countries out with the EU. The European Cultural Convention, for example, has 50 member states from Iceland to Azerbaijan. The Bologna Accord has a similar number and has worked over the years to evolve the European higher education area. Indeed, I uh, represented the Scottish Government of the time uh, at a Bologna process conference in Berlin in 2003. And I've seen at first hand just how much uh, those bodies, separate from the EU though they might be, uh, engage in collective European diplomacy on the same model as the European Union itself. There are many other su such bodies, some of which have been mentioned today. Uh, Creative Europe is rightly highlighted as a grand funder of projects in Scotland and its membership extends not just to Norway and Iceland but also to other countries uh, in the Balkans, for example, and from next year, uh, including Israel. And looking at the tourism sector, the European Common Aviation Area uh, is also uh, very important and also extends beyond the member states of the EU. And the principles of that agreement are worth noting because they so closely reflect some of the principles that we've debated uh, at other times in the last few weeks. Free movement of people and cargo, freedom of establishment, equal conditions of competition and common rules in the areas of safety, security, air traffic management and social and environmental uh, protection. And, and, and the point here is that there are a whole raft of agreements of that kind uh, to which other European uh, countries have access without being members of the European Union. And it's important, I think, for both the Scottish Government and the UK Government to reflect on that and to set out very clearly what their objectives are, not just in terms of the single market or otherwise, but in terms of these other uh, cross-border agreements as well. Now, we've seen today uh, a scribbled note uh, made public from conversations in Down Street. And of course, Conservative members will, uh, and ministers will deny that having your cake and eating it is the sum total uh, of the negotiating strategy to follow. But it is clear there is serious uh, work to be done. And we need to know uh, going forward what the objectives of all, uh, both the UK government and the Scottish government and the other devolved administrations engaging with them are going to be I know that Mr. Russell has promised to publish the Scottish Government's plans before Christmas. Perhaps we he can say more about that today. But we need to hear 
urgently need to hear from UK ministers as well, not platitudes, nor wishful thinking, but concrete and specific objectives and some idea of how they intend to achieve them. Thank you very much, Mr Macdonald. I call on Douglas Ross, who is the Conservative Party, eight minutes or thereabouts. Mr Ross, thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. This is the twelfth debate, as we've heard a number of times today, and unfortunately it is not the glorious twelfth. The Scottish Government have dedicated a dozen debates out of their own time to focus on Europe. And you would think, since it's a Scottish Government debate, they would fill their backbenches with speakers who were passionate, who were substantive about the points. What did we get? We got Joan McAlpine telling us about 17th century education in the Netherlands, and we got Stuart McMillan telling us about his international busking career. We heard about when in 1988, if I can finish this point, because Mr McMillan made it very well, so I want to repeat it. We heard in 1988, hold on, hold on, I will come to you both, but we heard in 1988, I'll repeat again, we heard in 1988, Mr McMillan went to a bar to get changed into his kilt. Then in 2011, we heard that his friend Tom and him met a local mayor. If that is the substantive points that the SNP are putting across in this debate, I think this should be the 12th and final one because they clearly don't have enough to say since she has remained, and I'll go to the lady first, Ms McAlpine. Uh, uh, it's for me to call Ms McAlpine, but nevertheless, Ms McAlpine. I, th I thank the member for taking the intervention. Um, I, see, I see that he makes a rhetorical point, but I'm sure he'll admit that the substantive part of my speech was quoting from the organisation Culture Counts, who made a very extensive submission about its deep and factual concerns about the impact on the cultural sector of leaving the European Union. And doesn't he agree with me that in this chamber, we have a responsibility to respond to those very serious concerns from expert organisations across Scotland? Mr Ross. Duty to respond to those things, but the fact there was so much filler in the speeches from the SNP backbenches shows how much they have to say on this issue. It is vacuous to say the least. I want to go on to a number of other points that have been well. I did. I did mention Mr. McMillan. So, with your permission, Presiding Officer. It's always with my permission, yes. Mr. Ross. Mr. McMillan. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And. Uh, it's a shame, actually, Mr Ross is here today after hearing the beginning of his uh, speech. Uh, probably would be better off it being out and refereeing somewhere. But nonetheless, uh, in terms of the, the points that are raised, uh, I was given some context as to, my, as to my belief and as to why I believe being in Europe is so, is so, so important. And also, it clearly wasn't listening, because I did indicate, in terms of the mayor, the mayor was actually the person who's doing the wedding, because that's what happens in France. So the mayor was actually the person who was marrying Tom and his wife, However, uh, the point was, very it was made very clear. Unfortunately, Mr Ross clearly didn't want to listen. Mr Ross. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I apologise if I had switched off at the point that Mr Macmillan was telling me about the mayors and how they conduct weddings. Uh, but he also went on to mention the World Pipe Band Championships and the threat they were under. The World Pipe Band Championships. The hint is in the name, the World Pipe Band Championships. And I think Mr Macmillan has to consider that. Just quickly, uh, now that I've used three minutes on the first two speakers to go through some others, we had Ash Denham, who said, if, could, if, might, maybe, everything was predicated with uncertainty because everything they are putting forward is to try and rustle up scare stories about the EU. Just no, please, Ms Denham, I have tried to say, if I take each one of the SNP members who I criticise for having nothing to say, you had your chance over six minutes, I don't have much more time. When we did get some substantive points, it was from my colleague John Lament who mentioned the Borders Tourism Partnership, and I thought he had a very telling submission when he said the Scottish Affairs Committee, chaired by an SNP member, not a single tourism body responded to their inquiry about the EU. I think that is very telling. Uh, we also had Claire Baker who mentioned tourism and the huge challenges it faces and indeed her uh, discussions with the Fife Chamber of Commerce and about inward tourism and promotional opportunities and I want to mention a bit about uh, that uh, in my own area of Murray as I progress. Uh, Marie Todd spoke about the, the Gaelic uh, language and uh, Morang Tang for that as well uh, and she also spoke about how crucial uh, the tourism is to the whole of the Highlands and Islands economy. And I fully agree with that. And I think, as I give some examples from Murray, I hope she will agree that there are some positives to come out of this, as well as uncertainties. And I see her nodding now, and I appreciate that. Mr Scott, 
uh, Mr Scott wanted to know the Conservative position. Well, what I will say to Mr Scott, uh, our position is we listen to the democratic will of the people of the United Kingdom. We do not, as a rump of eight Liberal Democrat MPs, Sorry, Mr Scott, I'm going to run out of time. We do not, as a rump of eight Liberal Democrat MPs, want to rerun the vote until we get the result we want. I couldn't think where Mr Scott got that idea from. But, however, I do welcome the comments of one of his former colleagues, Vince Cable, who said such a move would be a dis disrespectful to the voters. And I hope also Mr Scott... I'm sorry, I've got so much to get through in the last uh, few minutes. Tom Arthur. Tom Arthur, it was... I've written down passionate, uh, and that's a word I could use, but he said leaving the EU does not mean leaving Europe, and then he went on to criticise all Brexiteers, all 17 million in the United Kingdom, all 1.6 million in Scotland, and I began to wonder, would there have been any members of the SNP that had voted for Brexit? Would there have been any, would there have been any of Mr Arthur's own colleagues? And what we know is, yes, there was. So to be so disrespectful to the people who took a decision, I'm sorry, I've taken enough interventions, but to be so disrespectful to the people who took a democratic decision, I think is you know, unfitting for a politician in this chamber. Absolutely. Rachel Hamilton mentioned... Please stand up if you want to make an intervention, Mr Arthur. Well, I have taken several already, and I've got two more minutes to go. So, uh, Rachel Hamilton uh, mentioned, quite correctly, the tourism associated with historical buildings and Gosford House in East Lothian. Jamie Green mentioned, as he uh, is well experienced to do with his experience out with Parliament before coming here, the digital single market. And I thought it was extremely important to get on record that the UK is the top for the internet economy. And the final uh, open speaker, Ruth Maguire, who I can agree with when she says we should all have uh, an inclusive tolerant and outward looking way of our multicultural society and I welcome those comments. Uh, I said, presiding officer, that I wanted to focus finally on a few remarks which were alluded to by Claire Baker and indeed Marie Todd, my colleague from the Highlands and Islands, about tourism and how important it is for our region in the Highlands and Islands and particularly Murray where I come from. In 2014, prior to the formation of the Murray Speyside Tourism Group, Tourism contributed £94 million to the Murray economy. Almost three years later, that figure has increased to £106 million. Tourism directly sustains 2,500 jobs or accounts within Murray. 10% of the Murray economic output comes from tourism. 700,000 visitors in 2005 visited Murray from across the world. And there are definitely immediate opportunities as well as some risks with Brexit, Brexit sorry, with the falling pound and visit Britain data earlier uh, this year showed that the US and European visitors are generally getting more for their money and are spending more money in our local economies. US prices are now 10 to 15 per cent lower than they were prior to the Brexit vote. Uh, and I also spoke to uh, the Murray Tourism Partnership prior to today's debate and they gave me some anecdotal feedback from businesses across Murray. And they are suggesting that 2016 has been their busiest year to date. Visitor numbers year on year, for example, in Aberlour Distillery, up 18%. In the Scottish Dolphin Centre in my own council ward, uh, just outside Spey Bay, up 6%. Elgin Cathedral, up 4%. And Glenlivet Distillery, up 13%. These are the results we should all be welcoming, and I hope we are, across this chamber. Presiding officer, the majority of tourists in Murray are not from Europe or the rest of the world. They are from our neighbours and our friends in the rest of the UK. Places like Murray comprehensively rejected separatism put forward by the SNP and came within a whisker of voting for Brexit. These are the people we have to listen to and respect. And I think today's debate has shown a defi deficit of some of the arguments we are seeing coming from the SNP benches who simply want to foster resentment towards this rather than looking to a positive future. Thank you. And I call on uh, Michael Russell to wind up the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, before I start, and I wanted to start with something positive in Lewis MacDonald's speech. Before I start, could I offer a piece of advice to Mr Ross? It would be perhaps sensible if he spent a little less time running the line in Lisbon and a little bit more time learning the art of politics in Scotland. I think that was amongst the most graceless closing speeches I've ever heard. And the insults to my, colle the insults to my colleagues, I am sure they will th reflect upon them themselves. Let me start with Lewis MacDonald and his speech. 
I thought it was a very finely <coughs> made point to say that culture defines us. And he touched upon a, a great speech to this parliament, one of the greatest speeches to this parliament, made by Donald Dewar on the 1st of July, 1999. And if I may quote that, because I think it sets the context for what we should try and do. In a famous passage in that speech, and I regard myself as privileged as having heard it, he said, in our quiet moments today, we might hear some echoes from the past, the shouts of the welder in the din of the great Clyde shipyard, the speak of the marns uh, rooted in the land, the discourse of the Enlightenment when Edinburgh and Glasgow were a light held to the intellectual light of Europe, the wild cry of the great pipe, and back to the distant noise of the battles of the days of Bruce and Wallace. And then he went on to point out that that was the foundation for the voice of Scotland. And he said it was a voice above all for the future. And that's what this parliament really has a duty to be, to be a voice for the future. That was the Rolls Royce of speeches. And what a contrast with the comedy unicycle that we've heard from some of the Tories. And it's important that this is a debate about who we are, how we represent ourselves to the world, what we regard as valuable in cultural and economic terms. And the link between the cultural and the economic was recognized by Lewis MacDonald by Ash Denham, by Joan McAlpine. And Ash Denham went on to talk about the link between the cultural and the economic in terms of freedom of movement. And that's the first point I would make, that underpinning our success in a whole variety of, of elements in our national life is freedom of movement. It is the ability of people to come here and to work for a week or a month or a year or for the rest of their lives, and to enrich our culture. Ruth Maguire talked about the passion of one individual from France for the poems of Robert Burns. And there are plenty of Scots who go out of Scotland into Europe and to show their passion for things in those countries as well. And it is about that openness, it's about that exchange. It's not just about money that uh, we should be talking today. And so few actually did, and none on the Tory side, alas. Stuart Macmillan gave the opportunity to the Conservatives to say what they wanted to define what was important to them. And we heard yet again, Brexit means Brexit. Not a mention of the priority given to the single market. Not a mention of the four freedoms. Not a mention of the customs union. Not a mention of a Canada plus model. Not a mention of the EEA. Not a mention of EFTA. But just the best deal. Brexit means Brexit. Claire Baker talked about the digital single market and did it well. Marie Todd talked about Gaelic and particularly our contribution to linguistic diversity. The fact that the one thing that cements us into a Europe of languages. I speak as the first minister ever to make a speech in Gaelic at the Council of Ministers. And I remember the contribution and the excitement that came from other ministers at that meeting. In, indeed, at that meeting, having spoken in Gaelic, I was followed immediately by an Irish minister who spoke in Irish and then a Welsh minister who spoke in Welsh. I think that is still a unique triple. But it was representative of how we were folded into the concerns of Europe. Tavish Scott talked about this debate reawakening our interest in European politics. And he is absolutely right. We are reawakening our interest in Tavish Scott as a, a, con a thinking and contributing politician. This will not help him particularly with the man he's sitting next to. But I make, I make that point. He made a fine speech. And he talked about uh, it's how that interest in European politics would sensitize us to the difficulties that exist in the European Union beyond Brexit and the fact that we need a vision of Europe, a renewed Europe. I was inc <coughs> incredibly fortunate two weeks ago to hear Martin Schulz made, make one of the finest speeches about Europe I've ever heard, made at a dinner in Berlin. And it is about those values that we should be talking and debating. And Tom Arthur touched on the values of the Enlightenment, just as Donald Dewar did in 1999. And he called Brexit a campaign against Enlightenment. And that is something that we should think about. Because Brexit does call upon us to turn our backs on the notion of progress. It calls upon us to say that we will reject those influences and we will turn inwards. And that is not necessary nor sensible. And I in listening to Richard ha Rachel Hamilton, I wanted to remind her of reality. Rachel Hamilton accused the Scottish government, as many of the Tories did, of being doom-mongering. 
Well, here's three things from November that are actual facts. And the first of them is a point that Tavish Scott made, that the costs of Brexit are now becoming apparent. The bonus of 350 million a week has gone. The cost of Brexit is 226 million a week increased borrowing. That's a fact. The second fact is a report from Hitachi Capital in November that shows a fact, 6.5 million pounds of investment withheld to date. That's a fact. And the third fact comes from the IHS market survey that surveys sentiment. And the sentiment within the population has changed. Minus 3.5 in July, minus 18.4 now, taking a 10-year view. And in Scotland, this place apparently, according to the Tories, where we should be jolly, we should be delighted about Brexit. It is such good news that we're not reflecting the people of Scotland in that good news. What does the sentiment tell us? That in, in July, it was minus 27, and today it is minus 42. So the, the Tories are, do not have the courage of their constituents' convictions. Their, conviction, their constituents are not fooled by what has taken place. There is a problem, and those are facts. That is reality. I want to finish what I'm saying by reflecting on the initial speech that came from Jackson Carlaw. I'm going to recommend people look at that speech on video. I'm going to use it when I come to train speakers of any sort, because it was an object lesson for students of politics, of what happens when you know you're in desperate trouble. You gabble faster, you throw out more insults, you threaten and bluster. And what is the effect of that? What is the effect of that? There is no effect, because what you see is exactly what you know is going on. The emperor has no clothes. And if you doubted that, you should just read Mr. Carlaw's amendment. Because Mr. Carlaw's a man of subtlety. He's a clever man. He doesn't put forward amendments like this unless he's desperate. I just have to look at one or two of the lines in it. Leave EU on the same terms as the rest of the UK. Why would we do that? Differentiation underpins devolution. It underpins the whole of the UK. The act of union is an act of differentiation. It would be unique in constitutional terms in these islands if we did that. It would be disastrous in constitutional terms if we did that. But according to Mr. Carlo, that's what we should do. And then there's a reference to the negative impact of independence. Making this, and this is what the Tories want, making this a choice between the UK and the EU. But why? That's utterly inconsistent with the, the, the argument of the Tories already. Because the Tories claim that in actual fact you can have all the benefits of European membership but not be in it. Why would it be different in Scotland? This is an absolutely incoherent amendment. Talks about the benefits that Brexit may bring but when the chance was given, none could say what those benefits were. Talked about free trade agreements but couldn't mention what they were to be. The motion confirms what is in those scribbled notes carried out of Downing Street. The Tories intend the hardest of hard Brexits. They intend isolationism, and they are determined to ignore Scottish democracy. And let me finish on that point, presiding officer. This morning, the leader of the Irish Senate told Nicola Sturgeon before she spoke as the first leader of a government, serving leader of a government to speak to the Senate, that he understands and respects Scotland's vote to remain in the European Union. That's the leader of the Irish Senate. Unfortunately, Jackson Carlaw, a Scottish MSP, does not understand or respect the Scottish vote to remain in the European Union. So the choice for Scotland certainly is. The choice is either remain in the EU or be dragged out of it against our will. But there's an equal, equally existential choice for the Scottish Tories. Speak for the people of Scotland and in your constituencies, or speak only for your party in London. You can't do both. Thank you. That concludes our debate on the EU referendum. And the next item of business.